Dr. Ron Levi, an Associate Professor and Researcher at the Australian National University, Dr. Nectarios Karanikas, an Associate Professor of Health, Safety and Environment at the Queensland University of Technology, and Dr. Rhett Martin, a Senior Lecturer at the University of Southern Queensland, spoke to our Thrive community about how laws and institutions can create a sustainable world. Their talks were part of December's SDG 16 and 17 theme on how we can create a peaceful and just world and how partnerships and strong institutions can help achieve the SDGs. After their presentations, our presenters kindly took questions from the audience. The first question is open to all three speakers, so all three can respond to the question. So it's regarding the policies regarding climate change and sustainability seems to be more of principle oriented than a framework if it is a framework which could be measured is this the problem that the policies are more uh, vague in nature regarding climate change and the sustainability so any can answer uh, i'll jump in i, I mean uh, i proceeded in my work from the assumption that it was a problem, um, because um, either, you know, it's very common, as I said in my presentation, to have constitutional uh, protections for the environment that are vague. But when it comes to constitutional protections that are specific, I was only able to find four. So why is that? Um, is it because we don't need to, protect the environment? I don't think so. I think it's because the vague protections are ones that can be evaded. And so they're easy to, to get people to support um, because you can support it knowing that it's not really going to lead to any real sort of action on the ground. So that, that's my perspective. And that's, that's how I proceeded in my, my research. Can I add something to that? Yes. I, I agree and disagree with Ron at the same time. Um, policies are not attached to KPIs and the numbers. Policies are more generic by nature. Um, however, objectives must be, must originate from those policies. So the policy doesn't have to be very specific, but has to dictate that specific objectives in specific areas must be developed, which then can be attached to numbers, you know, key performance indicators or whatever. So policies by, by nature are vague. That's why what policies we have are not plans, are not concrete uh, strategies and procedures and processes. So that's my humble opinion. Thank you. I just add the point that um, I agree that policies are vague and uh, I just add the, the, the requirement to use uh, measurement capabilities in all of the sustainability objectives that we are, are seeking to implement and the absence of um, regulation to properly em embrace, in my view anyway, properly embrace the use of criteria and, and indicators of measurement um, across a whole raft of things that are going to feed into climate change uh, represent a, a, a policy failure in itself. And uh, we need to be able to uh require you know look at criteria and indicators of uh, of measurement in, in relation to climate change more specifically to be included in regulation and, and at, at, the, at the moment that that's not that's not being done thank you professor so the first question is to dr ron levy so some of the questions here have answered already so from a constitutional perspective is more the constitution seems to be some of the cases it seems to be vague because is it the constitution more principle oriented if it is more of a framework oriented it is very clear and clear cut but the constitution seems to be more a principle oriented now can the constitution be large by making it a principle oriented or can it be a framework um i think could I, could I sort of push it back to you a little bit? And how would you define those two terms, principle and framework? Okay, so framework, as I understand, it could be measured, but 
principle seems to be something which has to be the way it is seen. Sorry, you're just um, you're just breaking up a little bit. <laughs> so uh, okay. a framework can uh, be sorry. measured, I think you said, and a principle is yeah something which has to be integrated within integrated. The system. So yeah, integrated. Um, I mean, so again, I guess my my assumption was that look, it's it's all well and good to have a constitutional system where we we have integrated and and balanced principles and values. Um, and, you know, 99% of the time we need to do that because that's more sensitive to the complexity of the world. But then sometimes we reach a point where there's democratic movement and there's scientific movement, but there's no legislative movement. And so it could be that uh, we need a constitution to sort of shore up our objectives, to, to move forward and to stop balancing vague principles and to do something more significant. Um, I mean, do you mind if I answer um, Jonathan McPhail's question, which is kind of relevant? To yeah, this? sure. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Jonathan asks, you know, how do you enforce this sort of thing? Which is a really excellent question. And um, so you could have, for example, uh, judicial enforcement, or you can have uh, commission and uh, commissions. And so climate change commissions, environmental commissions, these are very common. Uh, in some places, they've even been judicially mandated. So in, in Pakistan, I believe, it, the, the court said you have to have a commission. So either way, you have um, a, a body that is hopefully as, as neutral as possible, um, that is reviewing aspects of, of the government's program. And so one way you can do this would be to have the carbon budget, the, the amount of... Um, the, the amount of um, pollution or, or carbon pollution uh, being or greenhouse gas uh, being emitted from different segments of the economy. Um, and uh, so a carbon budget like that could actually potentially be reviewed by the experts who sit on a, a commission who could then uh, perhaps rule on whether that's, uh, you know, on track to meeting a particular fixed uh, constitutional uh, commitment or not. And if, if the commission says that they're not re reaching that, then perhaps it could have some sort of binding power. It's a little bit difficult for a commission to have binding power because really, um, to some extent, a government can reject what a commission tells it to do. So this is why you might want a, a court actually to review carbon budgets, especially in a, in a place, in a jurisdiction where courts already have the respect of, of the rest of the government and tend to um, tend to be able to force the rest of the government to do things. So you can have either this sort of commission or the judicial model um, reviewing carbon budgets. That's one way to do it, but there are many other options potentially. Thank you, Dr. Ron Levy. So the next question is to Dr. Nakriyas Karani Kast. So the question is, according to the rules for conducting safety work, a series of procedures for the so-called permits by the safety engineer is required. What are the standards for aviation fuel handling? Yes, we have standards and we have a specific uh, processes, specific procedures to comply with, but mostly the protection is based on protective, protective uh, personal equipment like gloves and, and masks and, and helmets and less so in the core engineering part. So from an engineering perspective, yes, we have managed like fire safety, which is great. We don't have many explosions at the airports, thankfully. But on the wake health part, everything depends on the human, not the design of the system and the wake. This means on imagine yourself having uh, all those equipment on you, running left and right under pressure because there is a delay uh, in the service. There is um, of course, pressure to finish your refueling uh, activities uh, in order the passengers to be able to, to get on board. Imagine yourself working in a very cold climate or under 40 degrees temperatures in many countries, having all those on you. And of course, from an ideal perspective, then I'm an engineer myself. <laughs> we think that humans are robots, right? That we 
push the button, we tell them what to do and they will do it. And we forget completely about all environmental, organizational, psychosocial factors in the environment that affect human behavior. So yes, we have procedures and rules, but those should be the last resort. The main goal of occupational health and occupational hygiene is how to control things and source and not tell the workers, sorry, we're going to expose you to this risk, but you need to take measures to protect yourself. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So the next question is to Dr. Ren Martin. Uh, there is a limitation with our current view of environmental preservation and protection. How should we be dealing with activities that allow the environment to prosper and flourish? And the second part to it, at present, applying the preservation and protection lens is often a limitation of current environmentally positive activities. Dr. Red Martin, you're muted. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I think that there's a raft of activities that um, that are potentially damaging to the environment, and um, we don't really uh, uh, have we don't really manage or control that uh, closely enough. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the question is is asking me to address. Um, you know, different types of activities, or is it uh, is it specifically looking at um, you know looking at categories, broader categories? Is that can we clarify what the question is trying to ask in that respect? Yeah. So basically, the question comes in: How should we be dealing with the activities that allow the environment to prosper and flourish? Okay. I think that the the way that regulation is is currently configured is that it's um, trying to control uh, a negative influence, and uh, we're not really properly regulating to uh, advance a particular outcome in a more positive way. And so, um, you know, we, we we also have to overcome a lot of inherent uh, limitations that people seem to want to. Uh, or have difficulty moving out of uh, their day-to-day -day habits and they don't necessarily want to embrace a positive outcome. Uh, we saw that rec recently when supermarkets decided to uh, change and get rid of their plastic bags and that created uh, an ongoing problem with people complaining about the inconvenience of having to, to bring a, a bag along that required, you know, that was um, sustainably produced. I mean, where there are problems like that, we, we, that that are on such a fundamental and basic level, it, it means that we need to be able to change the mindset of people in a, in a fundamental way. And so um, we're not really regulating uh, sufficiently to embrace a positive outcome for the environment. We're, we're trying to embrace a negative or control, controlling a negative behavioral process. So, you know, there, there really needs to be a sea change about how regulation is configured and constructed, and to make to be able to embrace a positive uh, outcome and to and, and 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 embrace a positive process, virtually on a daily basis, at a micro level, uh, because that that's you know we're not doing that at the moment. We tend to be looking at everything from a macro level uh, after the after the the horse has bolted when the problem is at its worst. And we're trying to control it at that basis. We're not we're not looking at it on the basis of a, a positive outcome that is looked at at a micro level individually and from household to household. Until we do that, we're not going to be able to uh, fully advance in our uh, environmental agenda. Thanks, Dr. Martin. Martin. So the next question we actually do have five minutes, so I'll take one more question each. So the next question already Dr. Ron Levy has answered, but for the public, I am taking up that question. Are you connecting democracy with the commercial interest? Political process is elected, but the commercial interest has no one to give account. In other words, are they not out of the focus of democracy? Um, 
Yeah, so my my answer to that was that, I mean, I think I understood the, the question as asking um, whether, you know, what, what role commercial in interests have in the whole picture of, you know, climate and law. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually just added an additional response to another uh, viewer uh, recently where I, I pointed out that, um, the economic concerns are important, but overall, um, you know, there seems to be increasing evidence that climate change mitigation is actually important for economic reasons. And so, uh, you know, to avoid catastrophic uh, economic damage and so on. And so um, taking economic interests on board shouldn't mean that we don't uh, proceed, uh, you know, in terms of climate change mitigation. Uh, and so what, what I've advocated in this, this paper uh, is essentially a, a constitutional provision where we've already done the balancing exercise, where we've said that on balance, we think we need to act uh, more strongly in favor of um, climate change mitigation uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, and we are aware that there will be economic uh, short term, at least, costs, but we're going to go ahead anyway. So, uh, you know, as I said in, in my presentation, economic concerns can uh, can be over represented in legislatures where money uh, has quite a significant role in elections, for example. So don donors who are uh, from sort of powerful industries, for example. And so what I what I've suggested is that um, fixed constitutional commitments can be correctives to that sort of mis or malrepresentation to some extent where uh, commercial interests are excessively influential. So uh, there is so much of question which is being sorry so much about the migration of animals which is being written. The question is how should these issues about the migration of the animals be implemented into the research of wind turbines effect on wildlife? I get this for me. Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, very interesting. I read through the question. It's quite yeah. long and very informative. Thank you very much, Alexander. If we adapt the systems thinking and we really adapt it and not just talk about it, we can incorporate, we can involve everything that is affected by any initiative regarding sustainable development or uh, other solutions. The problem is that we don't consult with each other, that we have a monovision. We say, that's a technology that's friendly for the environment. Let's install it. Let's go ahead. And we forget about the side effects, the additional risks. Yes, there is a huge problem. And we don't really, Alexander, we don't have the knowledge, unfortunately, about communities in long term. We don't have much of the knowledge about noise and about other pollutants and how those affect the plants, it's not only the animals, it's not what we see moving around, it's both the fauna and flora. So we have a long way ahead, but we need at some point to, uh, to, to get together and talk honestly about all perspectives. We cannot keep everyone happy. We cannot do things perfectly. We cannot maximize. In any equation, we cannot maximize all variables at once. So we need to to find the best balanced approach. Thank you. Thank you. So the last question uh, to Dr. Van Martin. So might be in a minute's time. Uh, is there anywhere in the world where the legislation has the teeth to be so effective in the world? Sorry, Dr. Van Martin, you yeah. Muted. Could you please unmute yourself? In relation to sustainability, you mean? In terms yeah, of, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I I think that um, one of the issues I could answer the question by looking at it from the context of one of the principles, which is the precautionary principle, and the precautionary principle has been adopted in uh, European legislation more effectively than here in Australia. I couldn't give a, a blanket answer to the question in terms of sustainability in a global sense, but if we talk about individual principles of ecological sustainable development, 
and in particular the precautionary principle, it has been uh, applied more effectively in Europe. Maybe the pressures are greater there. It, there is what I referred to the need for application methodologies, which are not present in Australia, which uh, have they've gone a bit further down that path in Europe to enable a more effective application of the precautionary principle, which, by the way, is not just implying applied to uh, the environment, but can be it's also applied within the health industry in another context, of course. Uh, and so that there's a wider application of it across different different sectors. So I would nominate Europe as being an example where uh, you know one particular principle, uh, ESD principle, has been applied quite effectively, or at least more so than in Australia. Um, and uh, that would be the example that I would give. But uh, I, I think the answer to that question needs to be looked at in terms of each individual principle and how the they are applied in different ways in different contexts. And so it's a bit hard to give a, a global answer to that, but that's just one aspect of, of the answer, the, the successful integration of the precautionary principle in different uh, contexts within a, a number of European jurisdictions. Thank you, Dr. Ren Martin.